Um, I am the executive director of Citizens for Global Solutions. Um, we are proud to partner with the World Federalist Movement and other organizations on this series and indeed on a global campaign that you'll hear more about from Alan, uh, Legal Alternatives to War, Promoting the Universal Jurisdiction Effectiveness um, and um, universality of the International Court of Justice, as well as it's complementary with other judicial institutions, both those that are of an international nature and regional and domestic institutions as well. And I already see that we have about uh, 22 individuals in the chat. I can recognize some of their time zones. And so I thank you whether you're staying with us early or late. Um, and I'm coming to you personally from Washington, DC. It's a privilege. So I'll give it back to Alan. Thank you very much, Rebecca. So we're organizing this event as part of International Justice Week. Uh, which is within within that week is International Day of Justice, uh, which Rebecca will talk a little bit more about later on, um, which is the commemoration of the establishment of the International Criminal Court. Um, we're also looking at not just the International Criminal Court, but other international courts and tribunals, in particular the International Court of Justice. And this is part of a campaign which our organisations, uh, we have Basel Peace Office, Citizens for Global Solutions, uh, World Future Council and the World Federalist Movement are cooperating along with over 100 participating organisations in a campaign we launched in October last year called Legal Alternatives to War or Law Not War, which is really focusing on the role that the International Court of Justice can play in the peaceful resolution of international disputes um, and how to better use that the uh, opportunity of the court to take disputes, uh, either through uh, compulsory cases between states or through the advisory opinion approach. Uh, this has been complemented uh, by a impact coalition on just institutions and the International Court of Justice, uh, which was established at the 2024 UN Civil Society Conference in Nairobi. And that impact coalition, uh, as mentioned, is on just institutions, so it's looking more broadly, not just at the International Court of Justice, but the International Criminal Court, uh, International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, and other possible courts which have been proposed, such as an international anti-corruption court, an international court of the environment. Um, and in particular, elevating those um, and the ideas around the role of international law, courts and tribunals as part of the process for the UN Summit of the Future, which will be held in September this year. So we have two in sense, campaigns networks working together, along with the participating organisations. Um, and this particular event today uh, is, uh, is part of International Justice Week in two sessions. The session we are in now is timed primarily for people from Asia and Pacific, although we we see we have some people also from other time zones around um, and we're having a slightly more focus on the Asia Pacific region, looking at some of the court cases from the region and the relevance in this region. Um, and then session two, uh, which you're also very welcome to join if you haven't already um, uh, uh, registered for it. Uh, so session two is going to be looking more at complementary and concurrent pathways to accountability looking at ongoing atrocity, atrocity crime situations and cases in the international courts and tribunals. So that's an introduction to uh, the event today, and I'll pass over now to Rebecca to talk about International Justice Week. Rebecca. Uh, thank you. As Alan uh, gestured toward uh, today um, and in my... Oh. Yesterday, in my time zone, um, just an hour ago, um, was International Justice Day or International Criminal Justice Day. And um, specifically and literally, it um, commemorates the date which the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court was adopted on July 17th, 1998. Um, more broadly, the whole week has been uh, adopted to uh, look at the ways in which these international institutions can interrelate to one another, and that is the focus of our series. Taking International Justice Day as our starting place, however, and considering how rare and uh, perhaps chimerical and um, uh, uh, unlikely it seemed um, in 1998 that a statute establishing a new international criminal court would come into being, um, we take that motivation today 
there were about 15 organizations, non-governmental organizations that came together in the 1990s um, at first uh, to contemplate what would be a coalition for the International Criminal Court. It would go on to be um, more than 500 that would, uh, under the umbrella of the Coalition for the ICC, International Criminal Court, um, participate in the negotiations uh, in Rome uh, that led to that fateful day of July 17th. And today, the Coalition for the International Criminal Court boasts more than um, 2,200, I think, organizations. Um, it is the largest international justice coalition of its kind. And uh, we work very closely and both Alan's organization and my organization are proud to be steering committee members. Um, but the uh, endeavor did not begin and, or end in Rome and can be traced far back. Um, my organization and indeed Alan's were founded in 1947. And one of the founding members of my organization and a member of our National Advisory Council until his death last year was the last uh, living um, litigator at Nuremberg, uh, Mr. Ben Ferenz. And his promise of never again is the spirit that motivates our organizations and, and the, the enterprise of coalition building for international justice. Um, so whereas this day was one day where um, diplomats, civil society, statespersons came together in Rome in July, in a very hot July, in the Palais, um, and uh, many of whom were brought to tears by the prospect of realizing what had heretofore seemed impossible in their lifetime, if not even their children's lifetime, which seemed, had seemed a generational enterprise. Um, we hope that that spirit um, can be embraced today, um, including through greater appreciation and greater acceptance of the International Court of Justice's uh, jurisdiction, as you will hear throughout today's uh, proceedings. So with that, I think, Alan, that is my um, overview of what International Justice Day and International Justice Week indeed means in terms of the significance of this event. Thank you very much, Rebecca. And just before I introduce the first of our esteemed guest speakers, uh, just a reminder that there is an opportunity for asking questions and there is a Q&A box in there. So uh, please put your questions in there and then we will come uh, to round a question and discussion uh, following the speakers. Um, so for the uh, we have three uh, uh, experts in international law and um, with engagement uh, in uh, courts and tribunals. Uh, and it's my honour to introduce the first of those, who's the Honourable Matt Robson, uh, originally from Australia, but for many years living in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, he's a barrister focusing on immigration law, uh, was a member of the New Zealand Parliament from 1996 to 2005. Uh, during this time, he held positions of the Associate Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Courts, Minister of Corrections and Minister for Disarmament Arms Controls, Arm Control and in the latter position, he has served as head of the New Zealand de delegation to a number of the international disarmament meetings at the United Nations. Uh, he's currently also serving as the president of Aotearoa Lawyers for Peace and a board member of the International Association of Lawyers Against Nuclear Arms. Uh, Honourable Matt Robson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alan, and uh, for the introduction and to be on this panel with uh, people sharing the same interests and playing such an important role for world peace. Um, I have 10 minutes and you've given me three cases <laughs> to uh, highlight, and that's all I'll do, highlight. But I'd like to tell people that Alan is one of our successful exports from uh, New Zealand. Uh, he annoyed the power establishments in New Zealand on nuclear weapons, and then he went on to do this throughout the world. So we're very proud of the work that he does. Uh, as a Minister for Disarmament and Arms Control, I was unique in the world because I never found another country that had a specific uh, role for a minister uh, outside of their foreign affairs or defence ministers on these topics. But we as a small country in terms of population and economic weight in the world uh, are very focused on the use of international forums, including the International Court of Justice. Uh, particularly the International Court of Justice, but Ellen's mentioned and Rebecca of the other important forums that can be used uh, for legal legal means. And uh, even if we wanted to throw our weight around in the world, 
Uh, we could not. We have 3,000 soldiers, I think, and a couple of destroyers. But more importantly than that, we have a commitment to the uh, the rule of law throughout out the world, both for pragmatic reasons, but also because our own indigenous people, the Maori, this is why we also call Aotearoa, have reminded what was basically a colonial settler state that uh, we had a treaty which hadn't been honoured, uh, but it was it was a treaty which had the backing of international law. So it's important for New Zealand. It's important for the world. Just before I go on to the cases, and I realise I have 10 minutes to be uh, concise on these three cases, which are important because for New Zealand, they're uh, uh, cases from the Pacific region, but obviously important for international law throughout the world. But I just wanted to say that uh, in terms of the international court, there is often criticism from people to the idea that you can take a case there, but if the great powers don't want to follow it, they often just follow their own uh, path. Uh, there's a truth, there is an element of truth to that, but it leaves out the question of the fact that uh, nations throughout the world can join together and become a majority, as we see in the case of what's happening in Gaza at the moment. South Africa takes a case. It cannot be ignored, even if there is uh, the problem of having particularly the United States and some of the European powers, uh, get in behind what the court was getting at. Now to the three cases. They're very significant because all of them have been taken by small nations, small nations against countries that are much more powerful economically, militarily, and even politically. And the first one is the little island of uh, Nauru. Uh, not to diminish the importance, they have 100,000 people, but in the world scale, most people would probably find it difficult to know where it is. It's about 4,000 kilometers northeast of Australia. And it became important because it's a victim of, of colonial practices. It became a uh, 1914, the Australian army invaded at the beginning of the First World War and took it over from Germany. So it had a history already of colonialism. The reason people wanted Nauru was because it had phosphate. Phosphate was important for the agricultural development, particularly of, well, of the, the more powerful and advanced economies in the world including Australia. Three countries came to dominate Nauru, Australia, New Zealand, and Great Britain. And they set up a commission, which, uh, to be brief with you, but to, so is important, uh, was supposed to look after the interests of the people, but really just extracted the phosphate. And then when uh, finally Nauru, under the pressure of the United Nations decolonization committees, became an independent country, it was left with a devastated country, the phosphate gone, and uh, Australia, which was the main power uh, overseeing it, uh, refused to pay any compensation or rehabilitate. So Nauru took them to the International Court of Justice. And the International Court of Justice, it was clear, was going to rule in favour of Nauru that Australia had an obligation under its international law commitments. Australia tried to say it didn't, but the International Court ruled in fact was ruling. And finally, Australia was forced to negotiate with Nauru. So Australia at the time probably had a population of 21 million. Uh, it's one of the big economies of the world compared to Nauru. It's, I think it's in the G20. And it uh, had to negotiate and come to terms with Nauru. What was involved in here was environmental questions. So uh, questions of environmental law, the devastation of a country after being economically exploited by three countries, uh, my own is New Zealand now uh, uh, included, but Australia in particular. And it was brought to the negotiating table and had to settle in favour of uh, Nauru. So that that's an example of a small country in close to us in the Pacific. The other case that I was uh, asked to comment on uh, of, were two were one on whaling with Japan and uh, nuclear uh, testing with, with France. Let me deal with the whaling first because it's another example of smaller countries, and this time Australia and New Zealand, small in comparison to Japan. And Japan, with its uh, large population, at that time that the case was taken, uh, Japan was probably number three in the world after the European Union, North America. 
uh, in terms of economic powers. It's probably fallen behind China now, but still a very powerful country. And China, under the guise of doing scientific uh, experiments on whaling, was actually commercially whaling. That was the outcome, finally, of the court. But Australia and New Zealand uh, took Japan uh, to the International Court of Justice. And here again, you have an example of smaller countries forcing a larger country to go to international court and have their case examined in the full glare of publicity of the world. Because there's 88, I think about 87, 88 countries on the whaling commission. And whaling in the Southern Ocean, uh, near Australia and New Zealand, of course, was banned. There was a moratorium on commercial whaling. Uh, there was some provision for some scientific experiment, but Japan was uh, under the guise uh, of uh, scientific investigation, was actually harvesting a most endangered creature, the whales. And Japan uh, so tried to say that it was still uh, carrying out scientific and not commercial whaling, but in the court, using the forensic methods of expert evidence, and uh, all the evidence can be brought before a court, it was proved decisively in front of the judges that Japan was breaching the uh, conventions uh, and the regulations of whaling, uh, which the world had seen and established in international law. And Japan, powerful as it was, had to back down in front of the, the world uh, with its practices. Now, I'm not saying it's, it's perfect and that Japan hasn't, carried out other ways of harming whales. But it was an example, once again, uh, of a two smaller countries using lawfare, not warfare. Finally, uh, in terms of the cases, uh, and I apologize to my listeners, I've been traveling due to a family emergency, so I haven't put up any references. But all of these cases are very well known and very easy to find the further details on them and their importance for international law. But the final case, which has had a very big impact in New Zealand, uh, is the question of French testing uh, of nuclear weapons in the Pacific. This case brings in the question, too, of Indigenous people, because New Zealand, for a long time, was very slow to act in terms of the danger of nuclear weapons and nuclear testing uh, because of its alliances. And so, the pressure of Indigenous people in the Pacific, Indigenous people in New Zealand, and people like Alan Ware and others in the peace movement, made the government take stronger steps in relation to what the French were doing in the Pacific, using uh, territory which is not part of Metro, well, the French call it part of metropolitan France, but anybody looking at a map will see that it's had its own history, and its Indigenous people have suffered, like so many uh, in the Pacific, and so in 1973, I think it was 73, uh, the French were testing in the atmosphere, despite the uh, international bans on international testing in the atmosphere. France was very slow to come to the party. So Australia and New Zealand took the much larger country of France with its uh, force to frappe, its nuclear weapon, its uh, big army, big air force, and took them to the International Court of Justice. And the International Court of Justice uh, held a full hearing, expert evidence called, and the French were caught out because they had made public declarations that uh, they would stop uh, atmospheric testing, and here they were in breach of those declarations. The court found, the French argued, well, nothing was in law yet, nothing was in treaties, the court found that uh, when a country makes uh, declarations, public declarations, uh, to the effect that it would carry out some important activity or not carry it out, uh, that it was bound. It was bound by that. So it was a, sort of new points of law emerging as well uh, for all of us to be able to use so uh, that a country makes these proclamations, they can be held accountable. And under the glare of publicity, uh, the French said, right, we're going to end atmospheric testing and uh, well, go to underground testing, which still had its problems. I won't go too deeply into that because there was later court uh, hearings uh, in regard to what the French were doing at uh, particularly Mururoa 
and another atoll, uh, which affected the health of the local people of the Pacific, uh, etc., uh, and brought up the uh, horrors for the people in the Marshall Islands, Bikini Atoll, uh, which had suffered from the testing of the United States to the disregard of the indigenous people, which is why I mentioned that these are questions between states, but what is also brought into play uh, as law evolves internationally is the rights of indigenous people. And quite often you find in any of the cases you look at, uh, many, of the, many of the cases, not all of them, of course, for the International Court of Justice, the rights of, international, of indigenous people uh, has been has come into uh, both the United Nations uh, conventions, different instruments, and they're being able to be brought in as well. And even countries which have been the, if you like, the oppressor of the indigenous people, uh, as time goes on, they've often had to join forces with their own people, as in New Zealand, with uh, uh, we were settler colony and we were working with Maori on these questions. And so it's an important instrument in that in that regard. So in 1995, the case came, Australia and New Zealand took the case back because the French were still doing uh, underground testing. Uh, um, I think it was underwater testing is more, more correct to say. These are atolls after all. Um, but because it wasn't atmospheric testing, uh, the court at that, that time in 1995 found that uh, France was not in breach of that commitment. However, the constant pressure on France, and this is another aspect of the international court, is that public opinion in terms of governments throughout the world and the need for states to get on with other countries because uh, certain penalties countries can take action against a country which is in flagrant breach of international law. Um, it's harder, of course, for the, for the, against the larger countries but you can still see the effect that many, many of the peoples, if their government is immoral, can grow up a movement to demand that their governments take more moral stand on particular issues. So when the court speaks, it may not have, and it doesn't have an international force and go and arrest people straight away and do things like that. Although international arrest warrants can be uh, issued by the International Criminal Court and others. Um, it still has a political and movement effect in terms of inside different countries and across countries that force even the most powerful countries into the corner. And I'll just end by one other example of the power of the International Court of Justice. And when I went to study at the uh, Peace Palace, uh, 1987, uh, in, in The Hague, and the case at the time was Nicaragua against the United States. So they have another small country. The United States says, well, we're going to mine your harbor. We've got a dispute with you. Uh, we'll just mine your harbor. The International Court said Nicaragua takes the case. The Americans deny jurisdiction. But the uh, the Nicaraguans took the case. I think I've got three or four million people. The United States with its over 300 million people. Uh, and of course, we know its weight in the world. Nicaragua was triumphant in the court. The Americans dismissed it, but couldn't ignore it, and they stopped the mining of the harbour. They did other terrible things, but there was a victory. And Nicaragua, just as South Africa has done, raised a flag that's important for the, encouraging the rest of the world to take a path of lawfare, not warfare. I think my 10 minutes may be up. Uh, thank you so much, Honorable Robson, and um, you gave me a, a very fitting segue um, with uh, Nicaragua v. United States. In fact, um, it was our joint organizations who brought a case before um, federal district court in the United States that brought further attention to the issue that ended up with the policy of the United States changing, um, which I think was a fitting um, a reminder of how even when a, a state, a powerful state, um, uh, does not agree with a decision, in fact, decides not to comply with the decision of the International Court of Justice, it can, in fact, have lasting effects. 
Um, and here, I'll just remind that uh, the International Court of Justice, and we've been joined by several more participants who have come in um, who were not here at the beginning for the introduction. So forgive me for any redundancy, but the International Court of Justice obviously is uh, the, uh, obviously to some, um, is the cornerstone um, of the judicial architecture envisioned by the UN Charter. It is the primary method for adjudication and peaceful resolution of disputes among states. And there are four means by which um, cases reach uh, the court. Um, first is uh, if it is um, referred uh, as an advisory opinion. And I think we'll maybe hear some of the advisory opinions of which the court is seized. Um, second is if courts have, um, uh, sorry, if, if states have accepted by a treaty that the body be the uh, the binding uh, adjudication force, or thirdly, if they exceptionally have uh, decided that the ICJ will resolve their disputes over a certain matter. But fourthly, and uh, the, the goal of our campaign, Legal Alternatives to War, is that all states, of uh, which only 74 of 193 UN member states have done, accept compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice to resolve their disputes, rather than resorting to other means, such as um, violence um, and conflict. Um, and this is, of course, dis distinct from, as Honorable Robson mentioned, uh, the International Criminal Court, which has uh, jurisdiction over uh, individual criminal responsibility for atrocity crimes, um, including genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. And these are complementary, as we'll also discuss later in our um, in this discussion and in our second panel, for those of you who um, are uh, are gluttons for punishment and are going to join us later today. Um, so thank you so much, Honorable Robson. I'll give it back to Alan to introduce our next speaker. Thank you very much, Rebecca, for giving a little bit more on what the Legal Alternatives to War campaign is looking at, which is to build greater support for the International Court of Justice, including encouraging more countries to accept its compulsory jurisdiction. Um, a big thank you to Honourable Matt Robson. Um, I was particularly interested in a couple of the cases that you mentioned. The nuclear test case was actually what persuaded me of the role of the courts and the international law. Um, I did not start my career at law, I started in education, but when I saw the impact of the, the 1974 case um, on the, the policy of France, I saw the value that the International Court of Justice could play and so got really involved um, and that's when I started a sort of a new career and looking at the role of law um, in resolving these issues. Um, and I also had just a quick follow-up on the, the interesting case of the whaling because one of the key things about the courts, the International Court of Justice, which you mentioned, uh, Honourable Matt, Matt Robson, is that it provides a level playing field for small or less powerful countries to take cases and be equal, you know, under international law. But it's not just about that. It's also about the value of a law-based process. And in the case of Japan, you know, Japan lost that case against the International Court of Justice, but they didn't withdraw their belief in the value of the International Court of Justice and is still accept its compulsory jurisdiction. And it was Japan who raised this with the Security Council last year and held a special session in the Security Council on the important role of the International Court of Justice. So it's not just about winning cases in the court, it's about building a rules-based international order, which is where these judicial institutions, International Court of Justice, the ICC, International Criminal Court play. So now, sorry, not enough of Rebecca and me sort of getting too much interlude. We now come on to our next esteemed speaker, who is Dr. Penelope Ridings, um, who is one of New Zealand's most distinguished international lawyers. Uh, she's had extensive experience um, in uh, international law uh, through uh, in, involved in, in, in involvement in the New Zealand Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Trade, has been the Chief International Legal Advisor and Ambassador. Uh, and in 2021, uh, she was uh, appointed to a five-year term, or elected to a five-year term on the International Law Commission, uh, starting that term in 2023. Uh, so International Law Commission is a really important body. It was set up by the UN General Assembly in 1947. 
in order to uh, work on the development and codification of international law, and it's played an instrumental role in that process. Uh, for those who are not lawyers, the codification of international law is to put legal principles into agreements like treaties and, and conventions. So it's a very important part of the development and implementation of international law. Uh, us from New Zealand are very proud of having a New Zealand expert on there, and we're very honoured that you will join us today. So Dr Penelope Ridings, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Alan, for that uh, introduction. Um, and I also want to um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this event uh, and also for the co-sponsors. Um, and uh, I would like to um, note that I um, am very privileged to share the panel with uh, such distinguished contributors, including the Honorable Matt Robson and Roberto Bolanas. Um, I want to say a few words in my personal capacity uh, as mentioned by Alan, I'm an independent member of the United Nations International Law Commission. Alan has already uh, told you a little bit about the International Law Commission. Some of its past work has been very much uh, instrumental in providing the basis of international rules. So for example, uh, the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations was developed by the International Law Commission the Convention on Law of Treaties uh, and um, draft articles on uh, state responsibility. The International Law Commission also drafted the very first draft of the Rome Statute. So it is, um, has been very much instrumental in uh, developing uh, international legal rules. One of the things it's currently working on is sea level rise, which of course is particularly important in the Pacific. Uh, so a little bit more about the International Law Commission, what it is comprised of. So they are it's comprised of 34 uh, experts uh, from all regions of the world, uh, and it has geographical representation. Uh, it has been going for 75 years. This is our 75th anniversary. Uh, there, I am only the third New Zealander to be uh, appointed to the commission. The appointment process is um, through the United Nations General Assembly, so it's necessary, therefore, to get the support of uh, the um, UNGA to be uh, um, elected to the International Law Commission. So it is a really big honour for me to be able to represent New Zealand, but also to represent uh, the Pacific region uh, on the International Law Commission. Um, so I also, Alan has referred to my career as a lawyer and a diplomat. Uh, I've also been privileged to be one of the few women to have appeared as agent and advocate before the International Court of Justice. And I did this in the whaling case, uh, which um, Honorable Robson referred to. So as a result of this, I've been able to see firsthand how the International Court of Justice has not only the necessary expertise, uh, but also the authority to assist states in resolving their disputes. One of the things that I will be emphasizing, though, is that um, recourse to the International Court of Justice is a measure of last resort after diplomacy and negotiations have failed to resolve a dispute. And certainly prior to the initiation of the whaling case, there was many years of diplomacy and negotiations, but it, it was not successful in trying to um, stop uh, uh, Japan from undertaking its so-called scientific whaling in the Southern Ocean. The past record of the International Court of Justice in resolving disputes and providing legal advice through its legal advisory opinions is, I believe, a very positive one. Today, the focus of the court is really on the most pressing issues uh, relating to international peace and security, and is being used more than ever before. Um, currently, there are 24 cases before the court. Many of these concern the real issues of international peace and security in the world. Uh, so I will not go through these in detail, but just to mention a few of them, 
Uh, so there was a case uh, brought in 2019 by the Gambia uh, in respect of Myanmar's uh, treatment of the Rohingya people in, in, in Myanmar. Uh, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine, both uh, in 2015 in respect of Crimea and in the 2022 uh, have uh, led to cases before the International Court of Justice. The most recent one um, is in respect of the Genocide Convention. And uh, the Genocide Convention has been uh, the subject of other cases, uh, the Hamas atrocities in Israel and the Israeli actions in Gaza have uh, uh, occasioned South Africa to bring a dispute against Israel. And it has requested provisional measures, which are, as um, Rebecca indicated, which are measures pending the resolution of a case uh, to protect against severe uh, irre irreparable harm to the rights uh, of, in this case, the Palestinian people. The, uh, the, those provisional measures were um, adopted by the court uh, and the court has called on Israel to immediately halt its military offensive and to ensure that the uh, conditions of life in Gaza uh, are uh, ameliorated. The situation in Gaza has also occasioned a dispute between Nicaragua and Germany um, in respect of the claim that Germany has failed in its obligations under international humanitarian law by providing assistance, including military assistance to Israel, and that this um, military assistance risks irreparable harm to the Palestinian people. So that is also an ongoing case, which has implications for uh, other countries which export arms to Israel. And not only those cases, but there's a, a host of other cases. Um, there's a dispute brought by Canada and Netherlands uh, on the one hand, and Syria on the other, alleging violations of the Torture Convention. Uh, disputes between uh, Canada, Sweden, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom on the one hand, and Iran on the other, concerning the downing of flight uh, PS752. And between Iran and Canada, concerning uh, alleged violations by Canada of uh, the laws on state immunities. There's a similar uh, vice versa, and I say dispute between Mexico and Ecuador uh, concerning the factual situation regarding the former vice president of the Republic of Ecuador, Mr. Jorge Glass Espinel, being taken from the Mexican embassy. And there's also bilateral dispute going on uh, and before the court between Azerbaijan and Armenia concerning the area of the Nagorno-Karabakh. So there's a common thread in these disputes. So they're often between states which have very close relations with each other, neighbors, including neighbors, and where diplomacy has not been able to resolve the dispute. So the International Court of Justice is uh, often able to exercise jurisdiction because of clauses and treaties, some many years old, which provide jurisdiction for the court. And in some cases, they concern the interpretation of international agreements to which many states are parties, such as the Genocide Convention. And this has brought to the fore the involvement of a wider range of states as interveners in cases before the court. So the intervention procedure uh, was something that was used first successfully by New Zealand in the whaling case. And it's a particular procedure uh, under the statute of the International Court of Justice, where the, the basis for the um, court's um, claims before the court are that they concern the construction and interpretation of a uh, international convention to which the in intervening party is a party. So New Zealand was a party to the uh, International Convention on the Regulation of Whaling, and that is why New Zealand was able to participate as an intervener in the case. 
there are now uh, a number of interveners um, in the Yanbi and Myanmar case and also in the cases uh, with respect to being brought by the South Africa in respect of Israel and the Genocide Convention. Rebecca also mentioned the advisory jurisdiction of the court. And uh, this is um, an ability for the court to provide advice uh, to the requesting organization which is usually the United Nations General Assembly on important questions of international law. And there's two important requests for advisory opinions currently before the, uh, the court. The first is a request from the General Assembly initiated by Vanuatu uh, regarding the obligations of states to ensure the protection of the environment from greenhouse gas emissions and the legal consequences for states, which have caused significant harm to the environment. This is a, a widely anticipated uh, case, and it was the first time uh, for, for uh, decades that the General Assembly agreed by consensus to uh, uh, request this advisory opinion from the court. And this consensus-based decision by the General Assembly indicated the importance to the global community of this advisory opinion. The court has received about 90 submissions from states and organizations, and the process is ongoing and um, not likely to have a, an opinion until 2025. The second is the request from the General Assembly regarding legal consequences arising from policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. And this is, Matt uh, Robson mentioned, this addresses the right to self-determination of the Palestinian people. This opinion will be delivered tomorrow. So um, I, if you're interested in this case, we are all very much uh, interested in listening uh, to it. So we're living in a time of international judicial action and the court has never been busier, but I think this is a good thing. It demonstrates that states are prepared to put their faith in, in international court and the independence and impartiality of its judges. Rather than trying to resolve disputes by recourse to armed force or retaliatory measures. The, the recent cases uh, involve significant issues of international peace and security. Uh, and the court is being resorted to so that countries can point to and uphold the international rule of law. And this is particularly important when the UN Security Council, which has the mandate to uphold international peace and security, is unfortunately paralyzed by the use of the veto. So I want to also say a few words about one of the objectives of this event, which is to encourage universal acceptance of the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. And this is promoted by the declaration, which was referred to by uh, Rebecca on promoting the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice, which is co-sponsored by 10 states, including New Zealand. So just for those in Aotearoa New Zealand, by way of background, it's worth noting that New Zealand has consistently supported compulsory binding dispute settlement. And this support dates back to the League of Nations period when New Zealand accepted the compulsory jurisdiction of the Permanent Court of Justice, subject to some exceptions. And it was interesting, it was that acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction during the time of the League of Nations, which formed the basis for jurisdiction in the nuclear test case against France. In the San Francisco conference in 1945, New Zealand stood out as a strong advocate for the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. And since then, we've continued to support compulsory jurisdiction uh, as, a, as a way to resolve uh, intractable state-to-state uh, -state disputes. And the reason for this is, is very clear as Honorable Matson has already, Robson has already um, referred to. As a small state, New Zealand can lack the power to negotiate a resolution to a dispute. So, there was a good strategic importance uh, being placed on international dispute resolution. And also for small states, it's very important to place faith in the international rule of law 
uh, it assists states, especially small states, as being a touchstone for their international relations. And as a practical perspective, uh, we've also pursued cases, but have done so as a last resort, where we haven't been able to resolve a dispute by negotiation. And the, the benefits of doing so uh, are many. In particular, it helps to mitigate the potential impact of thorny political issues on bilateral relations. And it helps to divorce the politics from the legal aspects of the issue. It's always better to fight an issue on the basis of law than trying to fight an issue on the basis of, of um, arms. And that's why law, not war, is very much uh, a, a very important um, touchstone. So the the other thing I want to mention is that the um, the the intervention procedure is something which has enabled a larger number of states uh, to uh, appear before the court, and this has been a very um, useful way in which uh, more court more states to get used to the court and used to appearing before the court, and it it it's. It democratizes the the court in such a way that it is uh, a very useful way in which to uh, bring to the attention of the wider global community of the importance of the court and the importance of what it does. the The importance also of the court um, is that it ensures the parties to disputes can arrive at solutions peacefully uh, and according to international law as determined by independent and impartial judges. Uh, and those judges uh, must set aside their national affiliations for the good of the international community. And this is very important. And acceptance of the compulsory jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice demonstrates um, commitment to the international rule of law so like others, I very much support recourse to judicial settlement of disputes. Uh, for small states, recourse to the advisory jurisdiction of the court as demonstrated by Vanuatu, or compulsory jurisdiction as witnessed by the Gambia, or the intervention procedure as used by New Zealand and others, shows that the judicial settlement of disputes is a very effective way and to ensure that the international rule of law is upheld. So I think that concludes my 10 minutes and um, I'd be very happy to answer any more questions that I see uh, many in the, uh, in the Q&A. Thank you. Dr. Ridings, thank you so much. This is so helpful. Uh, your experience and description of the role of the International Law Commission uh, to start with um, is very important, not just for lawyers, but also non-lawyers to, to, to know about, everybody involved in these issues, that really important role, how the International Court of Justice works, which is really important, you know, the real value of having a judicial approach. Um, as you mentioned, it's, it's a different approach to a political approach. Um, and it really is moving away from the political dynamics as much as possible and looking at the facts and the law and the important role that it plays. Um, the emphasis that diplomacy comes first and that recourse to the court is generally after diplomacy has failed, which is so important because if there isn't that possibility after diplomacy fails, what then happens? If there's no option, no process of judicial process, that's often then when armed conflict you know, arises. Uh, so it's such an important uh, institution and process for ensuring peaceful resolution of conflicts, uh, definitely when, when other methods are, are failing. Um, and your, your description, um, overview of uh, the large number of cases that are in the court at the moment, the variety of them, um, what, a, what a load, a caseload for the court. Uh, it's got a lot to, a lot to deal with. Um, and in the chat, we put in links there to the cases uh, that um, are described um, uh, on the International Court of Justice website and also the press releases, including the one for the decision that will be given tomorrow. And of course, these can now be watched. Uh, the decisions are on uh, on court TV and on UN TV, so you can you can watch the the um, the court as they're delivering the decisions um, or making um, other 
decisions. This will be the decision on the advisory opinion on the responsibilities of Israel with regards to Palestine is the one tomorrow. So thank you very much. Your these co contributions really help to give a lot of substance to the role of the court and the importance of international law and judicial process. I'll now pass on to Rebecca, who will introduce our final speaker. Rebecca? And just um, two more observations um, uh, following on Dr. Riding's um, inspiring remarks. Um, first, in terms of the, the diversity of the cases before the court and its jurisdiction, um, the uh, case, uh, the advisory opinion that Vanuatu has brought that was unanimously sent by the United Nations General Assembly um, uh, to the ICJ was largely the work of um, a grassroots endeavor um, by and led by youth from small Pacific Island nations who were um, seized of the um, existential crisis that their nation's states are facing um, and shows that while the court may be um, far removed in The Hague uh, from some uh, individuals' lived realities, it actually impacts all of our realities um, and can be a force for justice in all of our lives. Um, and, and secondly, with regards to the case, which we'll hear more about also in our second session today from the perspective of a uh, victim and survivor of the Rohingya diaspora um, of Gambia versus Myanmar, um, of the, the, the use of the court um, for uh, that is seized of uh, now currently uh, for genocide cases. Um, the Gambia v. Myanmar pr provisional measures um, have been extended over the objections of Myanmar. And some of those objections were with regards to standing. So why would a small state in West Africa have any interest in what goes on in a, um, in a country halfway across the world? And why is it able to bring a, a claim before the court? Were what, what was the, the crux of most of those issues, most, uh, the, most of the four objections? Uh, also the fact uh, whether or not the Gambia was in fact a kind of shell for the organization of Islamic cooperation. And here the, the court did something very powerful in um, uh, absolutely reaffirming that genocide anywhere um, is uh, a threat to justice everywhere, and that any party to the Genocide Convention has the right to bring claim before the court. And so that means that we have seen a proliferation, not just in atrocity cases before the court, as we'll also discuss with the subject of our, uh, our second session today, but in third party interventions of different kinds. And we've also seen um, the ability of non-state actors, um, including intergovernmental organizations to intervene as they have um, with regards to the advisory opinion on climate change. Um, so with that, it is my deep honor and pleasure to introduce our, our final speaker, um, our, our friend, Roberto Zamora. Um, he is currently an, an independent attorney working on constitutional affairs. He is a lifelong activist who began um, his career in advocacy when he was pushed um, uh, to do so by controversial um, measures in Costa Rica, his naked, native home country, um, by Congress that erupted in the biggest strikes in, uh, since the 1970s in the country. He ended up holding a hunger strike um, with other university students um, and then was propelled into a career in law. Um, his career in law began at the Costa Rica University and even uh, while still a student in his third year at 22 years old, he challenged the president's decision of supporting the uh, coalition of the willing aggression in Iraq and successfully um, brought this case before the Constitutional Chamber of the Supreme Court, who ruled that the decision was, uh, ruled that support for the coalition was unconstitutional for violation of the value of peace, which is the Costa Rican Neutrality de Declaration, and also in the UN system, a violation of the UN system. So the court declared the support of this endeavor null and ordered the withdrawal of Costa Rican forces from the coalition. And from there, he has gone on 
um, who, as I hope we will hear, um, successfully championed neutrality and peace as a right, um, not only a human right under um, uh, domestic law in Costa Rica, but under the UN system. So with that, my, my dear friend Roberto, the floor is yours. I don't know what to say about after that introduction. Um, thank you very much, Rebecca, um, for this opportunity to to join uh, both uh, Honorable Robson and Dr. Ridings, uh, which are much, much, much more expert than me on these topics. So I'll I'll, I'll do my part. Um, as requested, I will focus on the um, specific case of Costa Rica uh, for Costa Rica. It's, um, if not the only one of the few examples of countries where uh, international court rulings are actually applied domestically uh, to resolve domestic affairs. Um, so the, the, the impact of international courts in, in Costa Rica are, are very important. Um, I, I mean, I, I was so dumb that I actually made a very short PowerPoint. I, I will actually, uh, use it, uh, so you don't have to look at my face because it's, my car is about to turn into a pumpkin because it's just midnight here in Costa Rica. So um, I'm not looking very fresh. Uh, so I'll share my screen, <laughs> go to the presentation, and um, we'll try to do this very quickly. Um, so... Um, for those of you who don't know where is Costa Rica, get into Google Maps and you'll see the American continent and near the ways in the narrowest part of the continent, you'll find that there is Costa Rica, um, just south of, of Nicaragua. Costa Rica is a very small country economically in terms of uh, land and population. We are uh, just about 5 million, um, similar to New Zealand, uh, if I'm not mistaken. But Costa Rica has had six cases before the ICJ, all of them against Nicaragua. <laughs> so, um, as was already pointed, in 1984, the case was brought by Nicaragua against the United States uh, before the ICA for military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua. It was the, the heat of the Cold War um, that I still don't know why it was called cold. It might have been cold in Europe, but in the rest of the world, it was very, very hot. And Nicaragua was a coal, you know, in, in that, uh, uh, in the Cold War. Uh, and we were not really part of it. We just happened to be bordering country with uh, Nicaragua. So since uh, the, the 80s, um, Costa Rica has had six cases uh, with Nicaragua in the ICJ. And even though Nicaragua uh, until today remains um, closer to uh, the uh, old communist bloc, uh, um, and Costa Rica is closer to the Americans, uh, the, the, the fact is that the participation of the court has kept the relationship of these countries stable. And um, I was going to point out to something that uh, Dr. Ridings already did, which is the fact that for small countries, it is more important to um, 
be part of these international tribunals. But in terms of power, it's it's also important because Nicaragua what might not be globally a very powerful country, but in Costa Rica, we don't have an army. So as it comes to military might, any country has more military might than Costa Rica because we have zero. We 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 don't have an army. We we abolished the army in 1949, uh, 1948, in fact. Uh, so um, not only for small countries, but in our case, for non-defended countries, we are a, a unarmed uh, neutral state. Uh, so we don't have any other way of defending ourselves, but through the recourse of the courts and the law. So it, it, it was a leap of faith. The, the not only the abolishment of the army, but but the the whole joining into the system of the United Nations. Um, so moving forward, I'm going to focus on uh, one of the the cases uh, of Costa Rica against Nicaragua, which has to do with what you see here is the is the map. This is the border on on top of the red line and. And the small dotted line is Nicaragua. South of that is Costa Rica. So in 2009, uh, there was election coming. So there was a, a political stunt. Uh, Ortega was seeking re-election. His official excuse or justification was that he went onto Google Maps and that area that says Isla Calero appeared on Google on Nicaraguan land. So he claimed it. <laughs> and 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 Google said no we, we don't we don't set international boundaries. What are you talking about? And so he sent the army to Isla Calero and the reason why there wasn't a dispute in an army dispute was for, for two reasons. One, it would be very difficult for Costa Rica to assemble some kind of armed forces to go dispute that. Um, the area is quite isolated, but also because the ICJ issued cautionary measures ordering Nicaragua to, well, both states to keep uh, their forces, security forces out of, of the area. Um, this case was of fundamental importance because uh, in the final ruling, it was found that Nicaragua actually violated Costa Rica's sovereignty by putting its military in its Calero. But um, it also showed that you don't need to repel an aggression with aggression. You know, Costa Rica sticked to its leap of faith in international law, and we went to death with our uh, vow to the pledge that countries made in 1945 when they ratified the San Francisco Treaty. And, and here Costa Rica, and, and I'm not saying this because I'm, I'm Costa Rica, I'm just saying this because I do believe that Costa Rica has been the, the most faithful country of all in the world when it comes to abiding to international law. In the end, international law is like commerce. It doesn't work without good faith. And that's why we have a crisis in international law because countries are not abiding in good faith. So um, moving forward, uh, I had made a very quick summary of the case, but it doesn't matter, I already went to it. Uh, moving forward to the, the domestic impacts that international court rulings uh, and international um, obligations can have um, in start domestically. As I just said, um, the whole foundation and basis of international law is good faith and its countries abiding in good faith to it. In fact, 
for most part, international tribunals wouldn't be necessary if countries would abide to international law in good faith. Um, now, Costa Rica has done so um, to the understanding that part of that cautionary steps to make sure your country doesn't end up in an international tribunal is to have the domestic check properly done by an impartial judiciary. And these happened twice. Uh, well, it happened many times, but of importance for today's conference, twice um, in Costa Rica at the Supreme Court in the Constitutional Chamber in these two cases that I was happy to be the plaintiff and I was a student, but I represented myself also in, in these two cases. Uh, one is, is the Iraqi war case that Rebecca briefly uh, referred to. Uh, you already know that in 2003, the US-UK-led uh, coalition of the willing invaded Iraq. And uh, Costa Rica, for, well, for reasons that we know, that is that the Americans push uh, that they were going to remove aid if we didn't support it. But, but anyway, the, the President Pacheco decided to support the coalition of the willing. Um, but there, the, the, there is a problem there, or there were many problems, as the court pointed out. One is the fact that in 1983, Costa Rica had declared itself neutral. And if you are neutral, you cannot support any party in the conflict. So that violation came very, very obvious. Um, the second violation was, uh, as Rebecca mentioned, to a value of peace uh, derived from the many international instruments and including the UN Charter and the 1984 Declaration on, on the Right to, uh, of Peoples to Peace, uh, saying that Costa Rica had throughout history, uh, by accepting all these international instruments, created this legally binding value of, of peace. And third, um, the Supreme Court found that since the Security Council never authorized the invasion of Iraq, then the country couldn't support an action that was outside of what the Security Council had authorized. Um, the second case was the nuclear weapons case from 2008. The ruling is uh, this number 14193-08 from 2008. This case uh, is in 2006, President Arias, Oscar Arias, decided it would, it would be a fantastic idea if Costa Rica started building nukes and exporting them. So he issued a decree authorizing the manufacture of nuclear reactors and weapons and all sort of stuff. So I took the, the decree in to the Supreme Court and, and there I argued on the basis of ICJ rulings and international law. And uh, the court ruled, well, not in my favor, ruled that I was right, because actually it's the country who benefits from, from the ruling, not myself. So um, the court uh, ruled that uh, now it recognized that Costa Rica had created a some sort of unilateral customary international obligation of peace. Um, it, it, it was a very complicated uh, phrasing. What I tried to do was I tried to apply the, the, the rules you used to, to prove a customary rule of international law, but domestically. And the court actually accept that uh, taking into note that peace doesn't make any sense unless you think of it as an international obligation, just like neutrality. Uh, it doesn't make any sense unless you think of it as an uh, international obligation. Uh, the court relied 
for the ruling of this case in the ICJ advisory opinion on the nuclear test case. Uh, um, sorry, on the, the legality of the threat or use of the nuclear weapons, but also relied on the nuclear test case because the nuclear test case makes reference to the principle of pacta sum servanda and good faith as foundating stones of international law. So it was just coincidental that both cases talk about the nuclear issue, but the, the reference to the nuclear test case was not because of the nuclear matter, it was because of the relevance and binding nature of Pacta Sun Servanda and the principle of good faith. So uh, I think I'm already over my 10 minutes. Um, I apologize for that. But with this, I wanted to very briefly show you the impact and the relevance that international courts um, have for countries in these two dimensions, uh, which are the international relations dimension and then the domestic uh, dimension and how a proper impartial judiciary can help um, keep um, domestic administrations under the check of international law to avoid um, taking uh, disputes uh, into international courts and just preventively applying uh, international law at home. And that's for my part. Thank you so much, Roberto. And with that, I think we already have some questions um, and discussion points um, in the Q&A feature. Uh, we've been monitoring that as well as the chat. Um, and um, Roberto, you as well as um, our earlier speakers, I think touched on one, which is the relationship between the lack of enforcement, the lack of a, an enforcement mechanism um, by the ICJ or indeed by any international court or tribunal um, and the record of compliance and the record um, of um, a, a political or diplomatic outcome that results from the courts and tribunals. Um, but just to uh, read the question out, what needs to happen so the ICJ decisions can be enforced? If any of our panelists would like to reflect on that a little bit further, um, um, perhaps um, we can delve into some of the examples as well of where even where there hasn't been an enforcement mechanism, there has been a, a seismic change in state behavior. And I'll give it to Alan for um, the uh, next question. So over to Dr. Ridings uh, for the first uh, response to that probing question. So thank you very much for the question. The uh, This is, of, of course, the the real issue of uh, International Court of Justice and, and um, the and its lack of enforcement. Uh, the enforcement comes from the UN Security Council. That is the ultimate body which uh, is able to enforce uh, judgments of the International Court of Justice, and we know what's happening right now with that. How, however, having said that, there are the International Court of Justice, once it gives its decision, um, even though it may initially, the party concerned may, may not wish to comply with it, there is uh, a, many examples of where states have, in, in fact, uh, complied with it. So one um, example is the, uh, the advisory opinion in respect of the Chagos Archipelago, uh, and where the advisory opinion um, said that the court said that um, the United Kingdom um, had not respected the self-determination of the Chagos people. Initially, the United Kingdom was concerned about the opinion, but it has since uh, subsequently said that it will abide by it. So this is the example of where peer pressure, uh, international community as a whole, can, um, through its own actions, without a UN Security Council can really help in ensuring uh, that states abide by the decisions. 
And um, if I could just add to that and then go to Roberto, we also gave the example, not a peer pressure from state to state, but of the, the bottom up kind of populist um, energy. Um, uh, and there, my, my own jurisdiction is, is an example with Nicaragua v. United States, where um, the United States said outright, this is an illegitimate court. It has no authority over us in the first instance, and then popular pressure awareness of uh, the funding of Contras um, and the um, uh, devolution of sovereignty um, and uh, uh, offenses that the United States was committing um, led to domestic change. And so that's also for, for those, I don't think there are many in my time zone on this call. Um, I hope not for your sakes, um, but for those of you who may be from countries that are deemed less friendly to international law, I think that is a lesson there is still hope. Um, so with that over to Roberto. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah, for, for the same question, um, the, the problem of enforcement of international resolutions is when they actually have to be enforced. Uh, I mean, when you have to resource to force to make these rulings to be complied. I mean, they, there are disputes that you can understand, um, there is a legal argument and it's not just, I mean, both parties can be acting in good faith and still have a dispute. Um, if they also comply to the ruling in good faith, then we don't really have to enforce the ruling because in good faith are both parties. Now, the, the problem of enforcement uh, comes when we arrive to the realization that not all nations are equal. And as this is a matter of fact, then we come to the realization that real politic is a thing and it's a reality. And for as much as it bothers many of us, there are powerful countries and not so powerful countries. And powerful countries, the, the thing is, when you make the question, do you really want to enforce a resolution against Russia or against any nuclear country? Or do you want to enforce a resolution against North Korea? Uh, yeah, you think it twice because the problem of enforcement is that it's the ultima ratio and it's, it's an ultima ratio it requires violence and it depends on how much capacity to respond that violence um, the party or the state has so the, the, the whole question has to, to be re thought in terms that enforcement should not be necessary if the international system was uh, actually functional. I mean, if states would stand by what they um, decided to stand by when they joined the United Nations, uh, including, as I would thought, uh, compulsory jurisdiction of the ICJ as the jurisdictional body of the UN. Um, so uh, as it comes to this question, I think that enforcement, the, the issue of, of, re, of enforcement should be rethought because it's, it's, it's seen as, as the main part of the equation when it should be as an undesirable part of the equation that shouldn't be necessary if countries would actually act in good faith. I see um, Honourable Matt Robson uh, also got your hand to address this question. Yes, uh, the... The question is a, such an important one because it can be dispiriting if people just look at the a court like in a, a local jurisdiction. So if I go to a criminal court here and take a prosecution, 
uh, the police can go and grab a person or a person go to jail, the state has got the power to enforce the jurisdiction. Similarly, with a civil case, uh, bailiffs can come in, property can be seized. Much more difficult on the international stage, unless you're a weak country, and then often many things can be done to you. So the important question here is, is really what role does it play? So I think we're not looking or we shouldn't be looking at the international court decisions, uh, ICJ or other international forums as the only mechanism, but as part of a mechanism of getting justice. And it can be that uh, when it was a, a decision of the General Assembly, or even if the Security Council uses the veto, or um, some other aspect of international events, that gradually the decisions of the court are extremely helpful in helping to build a momentum where a state becomes a pariah state. Now, of course, we've just used the example of the United States. It's very difficult for 60 odd years. It's had an illegal blockade on Cuba, despite the fact that the totality of the United Nations, uh, including countries closely allied to the United States, have said this is illegal. It's totally illegal. And the American government says we don't care at the moment. They had the same opinion, though, in relation to what happens in uh, Israel and Palestine and Gaza. But it's now reflecting back inside the United States, because what's happened in the international court has helped raise both the political, legal, moral issues and the thinking population, particularly the young people in the United States, including young Jewish people in the United States, are saying, we've now got a different opinion. And although it's still terrible and slow in terms of what's still happening in front of our very eyes, there's a process going on. Can I just use one more example? The war in Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam, went on for so many, so many years. It was totally illegal in terms of the intervention. It was a breach of the Geneva Convention. It was a breach of international law in so many areas. And my own country, New Zealand, uh, the thought of <laughs> Roberto talked about no army in Costa Rica, and I often think of New Zealand not being powerful. But in terms of uh, Vietnam, we sent soldiers, artillery, killed Vietnamese people. And later on, you know, we're on the wrong side of this. But gradually, the international opinion, the international legal opinions which were coming out um, to say the war was illegal, reflected back inside the United States as well, uh, with powerful figures raising the questions of international law. The American governments have never actually said, well, we were wrong but they had to back down. It's it's a very difficult question, but all I'm perhaps saying here is it's a the the question, it's still law. The international court comes out and says, this is illegal. People can ignore the legality of it, but on the global stage that we have, and with the growing ability of populations to intervene, as we are doing on this call tonight, and share knowledge and opinions, and smaller countries to band together, uh, then I don't think any state in the end wants to be a pariah state. So it's a, it's a complex issue, but it's a matter of putting together all the different forms of legal, often, and protest, and, and political parties. Perhaps just one last example. I think the question of what happened to Julian Assange, all around the world, there were parliaments who call for his release, allies of the United States as well. And the two key countries, the United Kingdom and the United States, eventually had to back down on his in, imprisonment. Um, so there's many, many other examples in the world. Thank you very much. We're running short of time, but I do want to raise two more questions that have been put into the question and answer box, and I'll bring them together. Um, and then ask all three of you to comment on those uh, before I pass the floor back to Rebecca for the concluding comments and, and any uh, short announcements. The two questions I want to pick up from the, from the question box is one on what about the role of people's tribunals? Uh, these are ones that aren't within the formal tribunals, but what role can they play? The specific one that's been raised in the question was the People's Tribunal uh, that Matt, uh, that was in uh, Sydney, that Matt, you were one of the judges for. Um, so if you can, this was about the uh, People's Tribunal on uh, the, the crime of the threat or use of nuclear weapons and its impact on future generations. 
And the second question is actually about future generations and, and how is the law protecting future generations being developed through the international courts and tribunals? Uh, so I'll go first to Matt Robson. And while you're speaking about that tribunal, I'll put in the chat the actual link to the tribunal and the decision. And then we'll go yeah. to uh, Dr. Ridings and to uh, Roberto on the, the broader question of how law protecting future generations has been advanced uh, in well, the International Law Commission and the tribunals. First to you, Honourable Matt Robson. Well, the Sydney Tribunal was uh, very close to our heart. Um because uh, we were able to bring my native country, Australia, into the frame. Uh, New Zealand not having nuclear weapons was left outside of it. And we came, unsurprisingly, although we were very uh, close, we were very clean to follow the rules of law and evidence. Uh, but we came down with a decision that the threat of nuclear weapons was also illegal. There's now an advisory and opinion, of course, uh, helpfully on, on these questions. And we used the framework of, of criminal law uh, where uh, if you threat to kill somebody and you're brandishing a weapon, you can also be charged. And that the threat of nuclear weapons was also an offence in international law. We found nine governments uh, culpable and uh, we weren't able to enforce their arrest. But this is the power of uh, putting out, we, we use international law, we use the different frameworks, the different cases, and we came to the conclusion that the government of Australia and the United States and the United Kingdom and France and the nuclear weapons uh, states, uh, by possessing nuclear weapons, uh, were creating an offence. This comes to the question of, well, what does it do? Well, uh, the governments haven't fallen because of what we do. But we believe that uh, adding that to the weight of so many different uh, forums, which have also come to this opinion uh, and around the world, Come, people come to see that their governments are complicit. They're breaching the uh, the the NPT. Uh, what it means to to Article Six to start um, abolishing, moving to abolishing nuclear weapons. We believe that our judgment, and Ellen's going to give uh, a link to it, uh, is part of that process. Just a couple of things there. I first came across the concept of people's tribunals. And they start very small and may be derided by the powers that be. But what they come to and the probity of what they bring up can go out into the wider stream of international opinion. And now we have more ability to get it out into the world. The first one I found was the uh, Dewey Commission, 1940, in Mexico, where uh, Dewey, a leading educationalist, held a tribunal, was uh, Leon Trotsky, guilty of all the crimes that Stalin was accusing him of, uh, which led to the purges in Russia. He found that it wasn't. It was the People's Tribunal. It was derided, it was small, but it grew and grew to show the falseness of the accusation. Then there was the Russell Tribunal on Vietnam in 1967. Bertrand Russell, famous philosopher, they came and, dis and found that the United States was guilty of war crimes. They had the backing of the Swedish state, of Olaf Palmer, the prime minister at the time, Divided by the powers that be, but it got out into the wider public and was part of the movement to see the war in Vietnam, the American war in Vietnam, as illegal. I don't say that our modest tribunal in Sydney will have the same impact, but I hope that it's part of the general opinion against governments to say you're holding nuclear weapons, you're threatening nuclear weapons, you're committing a crime. Thanks, Matt. I'll pass on to Dr. Ryan, but also refer people to the chat where Rebecca's put also comment on uh, the importance of people's tribunals and atrocity crimes. Uh, Dr. Ridings, uh, particularly on the, the question of how is the rights of future generations being advanced through international law commission and the international courts and tribunals? So with respect to the, um, the rights of uh, present and future generations, it's very interesting that the advisory opinion on climate change, which is before the International Court of Justice, directly addresses this question. So uh, as part of the question, uh, it, it says, what are the obligations of states um, uh, under international law <clears throat> for uh, to ensure the protection of the climate system from greenhouse gas emissions for states and for present and future generations. And similarly, it says, what are the legal consequences under these obligations uh, where there's significant harm to the uh, climate system 
with respect to peoples and individuals of the present and future generations uh, affected by the adverse effects of climate change. So this is clearly uh, in this advisory opinion will for the first time in an international tribunal directly address the issue of future and uh, present and future generations. The International Law Commission has uh, addressed the issue of present and future generations in not directly, but in some of its uh, outcomes, it has um, directly uh, uh, referred to uh, the need to protect uh, the particularly vulnerable and also uh, that includes present and future generations. So it is a concept that is gaining an international recognition in international courts and tribunals. The European Court of Human Rights in particular um, is uh, addressing that question as well. Uh, so I, I guess I can say watch the space. It is uh, really an issue uh, which is going to come to the fore uh, very much in the future and in the in the near future, and which is a good thing. Thank you very much. And I put in the chat a link to the amicus brief on the rights of future generations, which is quite detailed, that was presented to the People's Tribunal that Matt talked about uh, by one of the legal experts in the field, Dr. Emily Gaillard from France. Uh, over to Roberto, if you've got any comments on rights of future generations before we just very briefly mention how this has been, these ideas have been taken into the summer of the future and closing comments from Rebecca. Roberto? Uh, very, very quickly, I, I think that the importance for, for future generations is 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 huge, and, and I mean, and and also, I mean, thirty years ago, I was the future generation, you know, and so at some point, we all were the future generations, and we will be and stop being the future generation at some point. So the importance is that the, the court in many occasions make the interpretations of the rules and set the precedents that will uh, guide countries in their future behavior. Uh, just imagine if the nuclear test case would have gone the other way, or if the advisory opinion on the legality of the threat of use of nuclear weapons would have gone the other way, or so, or if the oil platforms case would have gone the other way, and then you know, as a matter of self defense, we can go and attack anything. So the, the importance of the court for future generations is fundamental, even when, when their decisions don't specifically talk about the rights of, of future generation, the work of the court is marking a path, you know, is raising flags, is signaling ways and doors through which countries should go if we want to have a rule of international law that is working and in place. So um, for these reasons, I, I do, do agree that the, the, the role of international courts is particularly the ICJ for future generations is, is fundamental beyond the advisory opinion on climate change that is coming and, and, and these specific topics. I think that in general, they do, do mark a path of action for states uh, that it's supposed to be, you know, a better path than the other one, which is keep destroying and killing each other. Well, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you to all of our three incredible speakers. We've looked at the past in terms of uh, cases and their impact and success stories, the present, what the court is currently dealing with, and the future. What, how is this going to impact positively on the rights and protection of future generations? Uh, we've covered a lot in a, in a short time frame. We could have gone on for another hour and a half. We will be continuing with uh, uh, related discussions in the second session um, of, of this webinar uh, later today. Uh, and we encourage people, if you can, uh, to join us. But as mentioned, this is part of a series of events that we'll be doing 
Um, and this is at the moment, we're framing up much of this in terms of how we can have some impact on the UN Summit of the Future, because these are key issues in the Summit of the Future. I have put in the chat the link to the People's Pact for the Future, which is elevating some of these ideas, uh, uh, recommendations that we've been talking about, about improving and better using the international, international law and the judicial, judicial institutions. Um, and uh, and a thank you to, to everyone who's been engaging in the dialogue and asking really important questions that have helped us build a better understanding of the value of international law and the judicial institutions, in particular in this session, the International Court of Justice. In our second session, I think we're looking a little bit more on the International Criminal Court. Um, and now I pass back to Rebecca for um, some closing points and comments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Alan, and thank you so much to our speakers. And I also want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, James May, um, who is behind the scenes uh, helping us out, um, and also Drea Klein Bergman, who has been an indispensable part of putting this program together. Um, as we close out this program and uh, this International Justice Day and Justice Week, I also just wanted to reflect that we cannot take these institutions for granted. Each of our speakers has in their own way contributed their lives, their vocations, their intellect to furthering the cause of an end to impunity, of accountability, of state responsibility. And today, unfortunately, international justice institutions are facing threats and intimidation. And I mentioned at the outset, I come to you from Washington, D.C., and uh, this is acutely felt at home. And I just wanted to close um, my personal comment um, with a uh, rejoinder to all of the threats and attempts of intimidation to the, um, the brave jurists um, and uh, uh, stakeholders from civil society, um, the members of courts and tribunals uh, who are on the prosecution side and who work behind the scenes, that there cannot be any room for um, a, 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 any aggression against the independence and integrity and autonomy of international judicial institutions. Whether or not we like the outcome of cases, as we've discussed here, whether or not we agree, and uh, whether or not their implementation and enforcement is assured, um, the steadfast um, uh, belief in the international judicial order and architecture is paramount to the global governance system, not only dreamed of in 1945 or 1998 or 1899 with the first Hague Peace Conference as we're at the 125th anniversary of, but kind of without uh, throughout the human experiment of trying to bring uh, order to chaos and um, a peaceful resolution of disputes rather than the most anarchic of phenomenons, uh, phenomena, war. So um, thank you. And for those of you who are in the United States, um, if you would like to, to join in the cause to stand up for both the ICJ and ICC against intimidation and tactics, um, please put your uh, information in the chat and uh, we will be very pleased to join with you. Um, thank you for allowing me that little bit of a soapbox, but it's very powerful in, in my jurisdiction right now. Thank you. Alan, what's up? Thank you very much. Um, and this will be closing the webinar, but not the conversation. We look forward to continuing this conversation and engagement with all of you. Thank you so much for joining us from wherever you've come and have a wonderful uh, morning, afternoon, evening, night. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Thank you very much, Alan and Rebecca. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful day, night. I'm going to have a lovely sleep now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's about time for me.